Greetings and salutations. Well, this is Featured Teacher. All of this is made possible by the American TESOL Institute. We are bringing uh, featured teachers and ask the experts, bringing experts in. We're going to have another session following this one next week where uh, 22 teachers can uh, be in a private session with our featured teacher for Q&A. Our first featured teacher is Gabriel Clark. This is my favorite page on, on, on the Clark and Miller website because I really, really dig the blog. I um, love the work they do. Our featured teacher, Gabriel Clark. Hello, Gabriel. Hey. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. Tell us where you are. I'm in uh, Plovdiv in Bulgaria. I'm going to hand over, hand over the floor to you. And looking okay. forward to um, checking out the comments in the chat. And then afterwards, when you finish coming back on and uh, talking a bit about, about you and, and, and this presentation. And yeah, it's an exciting topic. Let's, let's go. Let's go. All right. Yeah. All right. Off I go. Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. It's really nice to be here. Um, and uh, thanks a lot to Jason um, or Fluency MC. I'm honored to be the first, the first featured teacher. I'm Gabriel E.A. Clark. Uh, I've been teaching English since around 2004 when I did my CELTA course in London. And over the years, my passion for teaching, learning, and language uh, just got bigger and bigger, sort of almost out of control even. Um, back in 2017, I also graduated with an MA in TESOL and applied linguistics at Portsmouth University. Um, if, if you get the chance, uh, if you're a new teacher a bit further down the line, if you're an experienced teacher, I just strongly recommend doing a, a TESOL um, master's, the MA. It's so, so rewarding and enriching. And that, that was my experience of it. Uh, I'm also the Clark in Clark and Miller, uh, a website that helps learners uh, of English improve their language skills. And also it helps teachers of English get neat new ideas for their lessons. Uh, we sort of try to give you a, a kind of new perspective on the language uh, to try and look at it in, in ways you haven't really looked at it before. We have a blog uh, with, as Jason already mentioned, with hundreds of posts uh, ranging from listening skills to new ways of looking at grammar to study skills to reading to gaining confidence to phrasal verbs. Uh, you get the idea. It's like We try and cram it full of all sorts of things. Loads of stuff to dive into. Also, if you're lucky, you will possibly find a giraffe in there somewhere. Uh, we also have a bunch of books uh, to help learners with their learning and help teachers get inspired with their teaching. Uh, one of them, 102 Little Drawings That Will Help You Remember English Rules Forever, is pretty popular. Um, that's like a paid title, but all those other ones are free. And you will all get the chance to uh, download it, uh, download this free stuff and also get a, a discount for the 102 Little Drawings. We also recently launched a podcast, the Clark and Miller English Podcast. Uh, if you want some hot takes on English grammar, interviews with some of the world's top teaching experts, uh, or a look into the more mysterious world of philosophical linguistics, then that is like the place for you. So let's get started. I'd like you to... I'd like to introduce you to uh, two of my friends, uh, Kerem and Anna. They're both very successful English learners. Uh, Anna works at a US-based consulting firm in Barcelona. She's regularly flying to Boston, Amsterdam, and London for her work, uh, working with people from all over the world and does it all in English, her second language. Kerem is a musician from Turkey. He negotiates deals on his new albums, collaborates with other well-known musicians from around the world. Uh, he does concerts in countries from Canada to Sri Lanka, uh, and he promotes his material all by himself, successfully networking in English, his second language. So what's the deal with these guys? Well, they're both successful English learners, obviously, but there's a big difference between them. Anna has what we call a very comprehensive declarative knowledge of the language. Uh, what does that mean? Well, 
she can tell you how the language works. If you ask her, oh, hey, Anna, why do we say I've lost my keys in the present perfect, but then the next question could be, where did you lose them? And that's the past simple. What's going on there? I'm so confused. She can say something like, ah, because when we say I've lost my keys, we're referring to something that happened in the past that's somehow affecting us now. The time isn't really important, but when we say, where did you lose them? We're focusing on a specific moment. That's when we need to use the past simple. So she'd say something like that, maybe not those exact words. And what happens if we ask Kerem the same question? Well, he says, ah, I don't know. Is it because you don't know where the keys are? Or no, no, that can't be it. Oh, I don't know. It's just the way it is. Want to go for a coffee? Kerem likes coffee a lot. Uh, so what's going on here? Well, Kerem, unlike Anna, has uh, what we call a procedural knowledge. Uh, he knows how to use English, but he doesn't like really know like exactly how it works. Um, and by the way, most so-called native speakers of English only have a procedural knowledge of English, like Kerem. Until I trained to become a teacher myself in, in my early 20s, I had no idea what the present continuous was or what an article was. We don't get taught that stuff at school. Many of us don't, anyway. Um, this is one of the arguments that supports the value of uh, non-native English teachers, non-native English teachers. They've been through the learning process themselves. They can relate to the students more and they can explain things more technically and probably more clearly as well. Anyway, I digress, I digress. Karen and Anna. So they can both speak English and use it perfectly well, right? But only one of them was taught grammar. And that's Anna. Karen did a great job of learning English without any real grammar instruction at all. For, Kar for Karen, his relationship with English is a bit like his relationship with his car. He knows how to drive it, but he just doesn't really know how the engine works. Anna, however, can both drive the car and fix it if it breaks down, which is pretty useful if you're driving. So, what does that mean? Does that mean we shouldn't teach grammar? Should we only be teaching our students how to drive and not how the engine works? That is part of the title of today's presentation. If, when, and how to teach grammar. And it's the if part, obviously. And of course, the answer is no, we should never teach grammar. No, nah, just kidding. It's, uh, it's not that simple, obviously. There are times for teaching grammar, and that's what we're going to look at today. But I want you to keep Kerem and Anna in mind. Uh, they're both going to be very useful to remember when you think about your students and your classes. Uh, and we will be coming back to them later. But first, uh, we need to take a quick look at the history of English language teaching. And I'm stressing quick here, this is by no means a comprehensive view. Um, so yeah, ELT has a rather long history. But most, a lot of stuff happened in the 20th century. It was a very vibrant time for English language teaching. And on the whole, the methods, methodologies, practices, and approaches, whatever you want to call them, kind of reflected the times. Uh, during the very sort of conformist and logically obsessed days of the early 20th century, uh, we had methods that reflected that. Uh, most notable was the audiolingual method, which dominated language teaching in the first half of the 20th century, um, also known as audiolingualism. Uh, it kind of, to simplify, it consisted of teachers getting students to repeat phrase after phrase, after phrase, after phrase, and then sort of declaring that they had sort of learnt the language because they just sort of kept parroting the, these phrases. That's a big simplification, but there was a lot of that going on. Um, it didn't actually make too much sense and it doesn't hold up very well to what we know about language acquisition today, which is why it's not really a popular method of teaching anymore. Then came the 60s and the 70s. Uh, hippies, revolution, youth movement, spirituality, a full kickback from a sort of dusty top-down thinking of the previous decades. And this was reflected in all walks of life, including language teaching. And that's when we got this sort of flurry of what came to be known as the humanistic methods. Um, these methods were often pretty full on. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, they were sort of one size fits all things a lot of the time. They claimed 
They also claimed a lot that by doing things their way, uh, your students would learn the language three times, four times, 20 times faster than conventional methods. They made a lot of bold claims. Not all of them, but a lot of them did. And they also, uh, a lot of them got very, very experimental. Um, yeah, like methods like uh, the silent way, uh, where there was as little actual speaking as possible. Um, TPR, total physical response, where students learned just through movement. Uh, community language learning, uh, which based its ideas on sort of psychological therapy, Freudian stuff. And uh, my personal favorite from this era, uh, Suggestopedia, uh, that claimed to access uh, large reserves of the subconscious brain power that the brain didn't normally access. Um, uh, these methods were, by and large, uh, zany crazy, very, very experimental, and really stirred up the English teaching world, shifting the focus of the lessons from the teacher to the student. Before the humanistic methods, all learners were more or less considered the same. Um, if you could teach one student one way, then you could teach all students that way. The humanistic methods, they did that sometimes too, but they also saw the learner as an individual with psychological, cognitive, and emotional needs. Uh, but these methods were also, uh, let's face it, sometimes a bit mental. Um, so yeah, and many of them really didn't live up to a lot of the bold claims they had. Uh, they were also wildly dogmatic uh, sometimes, even evangelical in some cases. But despite their faults, they pushed the language teaching world into a more dynamic place. It was in this context that communicative language teaching started evolving. Um, do, 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 yeah, CLT. CLT started around the early 80s and has basically been around since then. It still informs teaching courses, course book writing, the way schools promote their courses, the way we test our students. It's incredibly resilient. Uh, and it's lasted a long time. And that's because CLT actually reflects research behind second language acquisition, the academic discipline that tries to understand how we learn a second language, scientifically, method, method, methodically, uh, not just relying on ideas and instinct. So basically, CLT is academically supported most of the time. It's also flexible to change and adaptation. That's what science and academia is all about, right? It doesn't have any of the dogma or evangelical zeal that those, some of those 70s methods uh, had. In short, it's sensible. It's a sensible approach to teaching a foreign language. One thing that I think is really crucial that CLT does and that makes it such an effective language teaching approach is that CLT places a strong focus on context and communication. Uh, and this is what I see as the core of both CLT and successful language use and teaching generally. And this is where I'm going to stop for a minute. And I want to give you a warning, a warning not to do what a lot of new teachers do, myself included for sure, a lot, a warning not to take new language out of context. It's vital. Um, you see, language is alive. It's, it's like a living animal. It behaves in certain ways in one situation and other ways in different situations. Like, imagine if you were a natural historian and you wanted to study a new species of giraffe, for example. What would you do? Would you find the giraffe, shoot it dead, take it home, and then start pulling out its guts and insides and examine the internal organs and skin and eyes and stuff? Then maybe stick the rest of it inside a jar and put it on your shelf. No, right? That wouldn't really help you understand much about the giraffe, and it would also just be pretty weird, I guess. So, yeah, what would you do? Well, the best thing to do would just be to watch it. Watch it in its natural habitat. See how it behaves in different situations. What animals does it get on with? Which ones doesn't it like? How does it mate? What and when does it eat? Does it migrate? Does it like chocolate cake? That 
is how you understand the giraffe and that is how you understand language and that is also how your students can understand the language by being exposed to as much natural communication in context as possible. So what's my message here? Well, today we're going to start with the don'ts um, and we'll get to the do's later. But for now, I guess my message is simple. It's don't kill the giraffe. Yeah, don't give your students isolated, non-communicative, out of context examples. It will not help them understand much. To give you an idea of what not to do, I want to show you some real life examples of giraffe killing. Uh, the best examples, of course, can be found on social media. Um, and uh, yes, so I bet a lot of you, I, I know for sure some of you uh, have uh, joined some of the various Learn English or Teach English Facebook groups, right? There are lots of them out there. Um, of course, uh, some of them, like Jason's uh, Innovative Teachers of English, are awesome, really awesome, full of bright, dynamic teachers and sometimes learners with thoughtful questions, uh, helpful input and bright ideas. Some of them, however, well, it's <laughs> no way of putting it, some of them are just awful, just awful. Um, and here are the sorts of giraffe killing examples you can find on a lot of them. Uh, you see stuff like uh, this giraffe killing. Um, the chiefs or chiefs of the tribes decided to fight for their lands, A or B, everyone wrote B, great, okay, they got the answer right, but have they really learned? Is this really a productive use of time? Um, there's no context, no communication going on here. Loads of examples, I got a few up. Um, same sort of thing, giraffe killing. No, no context, no, nothing. I mean, it, everything helps a little bit, but there's, a, there's, there's much better use of uh, post space really here. Um, same thing, people are just replying and it's like, yeah, I, I'm not sure exactly what this is supposed to achieve, really. I think it's just strange, yeah. Um, yeah, so here we have it. Um, and sometimes even, um, uh, the, sometimes the context is so lacking, like in this example, that in a sort of more unusual situation, but certainly a possible one, the supposed incorrect answer could actually be right. Uh, so, you know, obviously they want you to say, whenever she calls me, I feel very happy, but I don't know, it's conceivable that so that she calls me, I feel very happy. And not as inconceivable as you might think. People, ha people play with language all the time. People have, find themselves in odd situations and end up coming out with some strange sentences. And that is how language works. And so that she calls me, I feel very happy is, is certainly possible. Um, okay, so this is, context is everything. Communication is everything. Don't take the language out of context and throw things like this at your students. This is a not how not to teach grammar moment. Um, sometimes when I'm going through Facebook pages like this, uh, I see someone asking like a grammar question as well. Um, and one time I saw someone asking something like this. Um, uh, what's the difference between in the hospital and at the hospital? And um, because this was on Facebook, it didn't take long for a giraffe killer to turn up. Uh, someone turned up with an answer, but it really wasn't the best answer. Uh, he said something like, if you say in the hospital, it means you are ill. And if you say at the hospital, you're visiting a friend. Yeah, which, I mean, that's nonsense, right? Like, the real answer to this question is, is not, nothing, or at least not much. There's no real difference. Uh, we use both of these in either situation. It's just one of those things. Um, but this is the sort of temptation we get all the time as teachers, especially when we're just starting out. A student asks us a question like this and we feel we have to show our expertise. We feel we have to give them a knowledgeable and learned answer. And sometimes there just isn't an answer and, and that's okay. Um, saying there's no difference is always a better idea than killing a giraffe. So yeah, don't kill the giraffe. But it's not just online where we can see giraffe killing. Uh, one more example of the don'ts. We, uh, this don't comes from course books, uh, actually. We can find this sort of lack of context and communication in course, course books too. 
Um, for example, many course books still have whole units dedicated to reported speech. So I realized that a lot of you are quite new teachers and a lot of you are experienced teachers, but just to level everything, uh, I'm going to just quickly describe uh, what reported speech is. Um, let's say you're at home and your housemate says something like, uh, hey, I'm going to the shops. Uh, do you want anything? Uh, you say no and they leave. Then your other flatmate, who wasn't listening, he was listening to Metallica instead, uh, says, uh, oh, what does she say? So what do you say to him, your, your metal head flatmate? Well, according to the course books, you, you need to say, she said that she was going to the shops and asked whether we wanted anything. Right, yeah, cool. Okay, it's technically correct. It's, it's right, but that's really not what most people would say in this situation, especially in a casual situation like this. If you were presenting at the UN or giving a formal presentation to the board of directors at a massive corporation, and sure, this is, uh, this is useful. And, you know, we, I'm not saying we shouldn't teach it, but we should also teach what is useful too. Uh, your flatmate, prob uh, you might also just say something like, oh yeah, she just said to, do you want anything from the shop? Or... She was like, want anything from the shop? And if that's too unbearably casual for you, there's also something like, I don't know, where's my mouse gone? She was like, want anything from the shop? Um, that's what I just said. Nah, here we go. She says she's going to the shop and do you want anything? But reported, less, uh, reported speech lessons are everywhere, robbing us of real language context or at least robbing us of the range of language that we can use. Um, but I know why it's there. I know why it's in the books. It's there because it's easy to teach, uh, not really to learn. And it's not particularly, well, it's quite useful, but not as useful as a whole unit. It's there so we can make nice, easy, organized lesson plans. There are lots of clearly defined and when you get into it, pretty complicated rules too. And you know, if, if you have lots of rules, then you, you can plan a lesson more meticulously and show off your, your skills. Uh, ch change present to the past, present perfect becomes past perfect. So does the past, uh, now becomes then, should becomes have to. Tomorrow, we, we have to say the following day, uh, WH questions have no question forms, yes or no questions, you have to add if or, or whether. <sighs> yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's all well and good, but you need to ask yourself, is this what your students need? Teaching isn't about control. It's about providing our learners with learning opportunities, opportunities to see and use English as naturally as possible. And I'm going to come back to this. It means context and communication. Okay, so yeah, that was all a bit negative. I've, I've gone down to like a how not to teach grammar. But let's uh, step back and remind ourselves of the title of the presentation, if, when, and how to teach grammar. Let's start with the if. This isn't gonna take long because the answer is yes. Yeah, of course we should teach grammar, but the key is how, and obviously we'll get to that in a bit. But what about the when? Okay, this depends very much on what type of class you have. Are you teaching one-to-one -one business people or a class of 54-year-olds? Not 54-year-olds, but 50, but never mind. Uh, but yeah, one thing I can tell you for sure, and it applies across any sort of teaching context, is that if you start with meaning, then the technical stuff can follow more easily. Bring the language to the classroom as naturally as possible. You want the students to want to use the new language first. Then, when you teach it to them, they will be much more receptive. Uh, you need to wait until they need to say something but can't. That's when they need you and that's when the grammar should be taught. Uh, there's a term for this, it's called uh, emerging language. Uh, that situation when the student has got to a stage where she needs to express a certain thing, uh, but she's just missing the language uh, to do it. So, the best thing to teach grammar? Uh, well, when the language is emerging. Uh, you need to create the communicative conditions for the learner to need the grammar. Then you give it to them. Uh, 
you wait for or engineer the emerging language. And this brings us on to the how. How do we do that? Okay, to illustrate this, I want to show you a couple of lessons. The lesson starts. The teacher immediately writes present perfect on the board and says, today we are going to learn the present perfect. He draws a timeline on the board and arrows and X's and, and all sorts of exciting visual things. Uh, he says, we use the present perfect for events that happened in the past and are still continuing or events that happened in the past with an effect that's still continuing. And then he gives the students this. Uh, yeah, the dreaded gap fill. Do these students, once they've done this, do they know how to use the present perfect well? Will filling in these gaps make them any better at using it? I mean, like a bit, everything helps. Even, even the giraffe killing on Facebook, that, that it helps a bit. But again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with doing gap fills, but if this is the main introduction to your lesson, and this is the main introduction the students have to this grammar, this is not good. Uh, I would argue that there's a time and a place for gap fills, but they do not help students much when it comes to using the language out there in the real world. They need context and communication right from the beginning. So, Karim and Anna, again, I told you they'd be back. Uh, so yeah, remember how Karim has a procedural knowledge and Anna has a declarative knowledge of the language. Now, imagine a line like this. You don't need to imagine it, I've drawn it for you. Uh, well, imagine a line with, a procedural, with procedural on one end and declarative on the other. This present perfect lesson that I just described was very declarative style of lesson. It had very little procedural elements, or rather I should say opportunities for the learners to pick up the language, procedural knowledge of the language. There was no communication, there was no context. Uh, we need to add context. We need to add communication. So how do we do that? Well, like I said, we have to start from meaning. Let's look at a better lesson. The teacher begins the lesson showing a photo of what she did last weekend. It's a skydive. Yep, she went skydiving. She shows more pictures of her skydiving experience. It's uh, going back 10 years. She's a fan. She's been doing it for years. You don't need to be a skydiver to do this lesson. You can put anything about yourself that's interesting. Obviously, skydiving is just a nice extreme example. Um, while showing the pictures to a student, she's encouraging them to ask questions. Uh, they say stuff like, uh, do you skydive a long time? Uh, or how much time are you doing this already? She makes notes of the student's errors and also makes sure to model the correct forms as well. Oh, I've been skydiving for about 10 years. Jan, have you ever gone skydiving? Some of the brighter students in the, le in the class might already be picking up the language just from the modeling and just from this level of communication without any grammar teaching at all, just modeling and interaction and making sure they're interested and engaged. Um, but it's not quite enough. For the next stage, she writes down some of the mistake sentences that her students made on the board and asks them how to correct them. They do it in teams, uh, they turn it into a game, which is fun. Uh, the students offer their correct sentence one by one and the teacher awards points to the teams that get it right. Now, this is the key part. Before moving on to the next sentence, whether the students have got it right or not, she explains the grammar behind the sentence. She points out the mistake, models the correct form, and this is when she explains why. She does the Anna stuff here, the grammar teaching, after the meaning, after the context, after the interaction, in the middle of a game. Yeah, uh, when she does this, three, th three important things are happening. Uh, first of all, the students have the full context of the sentence. They remember what they were talking about before and after that sentence was said. The giraffe is alive and eating chocolate cake and not in a jar on the teacher's shelf. The language is alive for the students. Um, also, uh, the different uses of the target language are covered separately. Uh, so yeah, uh, the present perfect has lots of different sort of ways you can use it. In fact, each time we use a sentence with 
present perfect, for example, we're always doing it for slightly different reasons. Every interaction is slightly different. So when she does a bunch of different present perfect sentences on the board and does this error correction and addresses each one individually, each unique use of the present perfect can be shown with its own context and with its own communicative setting. Uh, finally, the student's concentration span is not being challenged. They know that they're going to get a short micro explanation, then they go on playing the game. So motivation remains high. Uh, yeah, so the students are more engaged and everyone's life is easier, basically. So as the lesson continues and the answers come in, she starts explaining how the grammar works, asking the students questions on the way all the time. Have you ever eaten sushi, Jamie? What was it like? And what's happening here is that she's moving towards this sort of declarative side of this line. Um, as she moves along the line, the students, more like Anna, will start reacting and responding and, and understanding, hopefully. Um, uh, yeah, so we start with a sort of purely communicative setting and we move towards the declarative side of things where you can do more explicit grammar like teaching. But one thing about SLA research is clear, whether you're a Kerem sort of guy or an Anna sort of guy. Um, uh, do, 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 what is it? SLA research emphasizes context and meaning as key to language learning. We do teach grammar even technically with arrows and X's and timelines. That's cool, it's fine. But if you start with the meaning first, then everyone will learn more effectively. It's okay to teach grammar, but it's so important to start with meaning and keep the context alive, keep the giraffe alive. From meaning comes context and communication. Once you've got that, you can move towards the technical side, the grammar books, the diagrams, the formulas, the arrows on the board. That's because if you generate the need for the language in the students, that emerging language, then the students will understand why they're using this language. If they understand what the language is for before they understand how to use it, they'll learn quicker and will probably be much happier about it. I mean, would you really wanna learn something if you have no idea why you're learning it or what it's for? Yeah, me neither. So, how to teach grammar in the classroom. Let's get some bullet points up. What have we learned from the, these, this bad lesson and this good lesson? Start with meaning. Uh, start on this sort of procedural, communicative side of the line. Uh, be interactive. It doesn't matter if the students make mistakes. It's all about communication. Move gradually along the line uh, to the other side of the line as the lesson goes on. You're picking up more and more Annas as you do that the percentage of people who are understanding what's going on increases in the classroom. And finally, make sure you're communicating with the students at every stage. Keep the giraffe alive, keep communicating, keep asking questions, getting answers, opening little discussions. Um, that's really important. Most of your students will be somewhere between Karen and Anna. And a lot of students, in fact, probably most of us are adaptable anyway. We can be anywhere on this line. But always remember, very important, context and communication. Fantastic. Uh, I can't hear you, but we know you're clapping. There's a great chat going on. Uh, I don't know. I don't think I can see it because I got the screen share. Oh, no, don't worry. Cool. I couldn't agree with you more uh, on the things you were saying about robbing us of real language. I love that. Uh, when you look back at like grammar translation, you look back mm. at a time which is not that long ago when it was really more about studying a language as a subject, you know, it wasn't about everyday communication. So it kind of made sense that it was that way. I often make the analogy with like computer science versus, you know, learning how to use a computer. Can I draw a metaphor? Please. Um, yeah, yeah. So I like that you brought up grammar translation and the fact that it wasn't necessary to communicate in the language. They were just like interested in it. So if you were a biologist, you might shoot the giraffe and you might start tearing it apart. And mm. that's maybe comparable to grammar translation and, and learning a language as a, as a sort of um, mm -hmm. academic subject rather than yeah. a communicative tool. Yeah, we all probably feel pretty similarly about audio lingual and you know, if it's not in context, why are we just repeating these things that are, uh, don't connect to you know, our daily lives and you know, aren't, aren't functional, mm. et cetera, et cetera. But I'm a big believer in, um, 
communicative language teaching, not directly, but ultimately throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Just the idea that, you know, uh, when Audiolingo came along, what was really missing and what they provided was the idea of repetition. That language is a skill. You know, you don't learn to dance uh, without repeating the moves and making mm -hmm. things and, and, and modeling, you know, follow, watching somebody else do it, you know, so that the, the whole, uh, you know, audiolingual really made sense in, in that way. I'm wondering if you think that just, you know, a focus on context, meaning and communication is enough if the students aren't seeing those structures enough, hearing them enough. If you're seeing the giraffe in the zoo <laughs> in class, right. you're, you know, you're getting close to it. You're not killing it. You know, you're, you're doing it. But then when you go out in the real world, you either don't see the giraffes in the wild or you see them, but you can't get close to them because it's too hard. You're not getting, you know, enough repetition with those structures. Present perfect is going pew, like this. Irregular verbs are going like that. Where do you feel that the exposure, okay. the repetition piece comes in? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess the answer is why not have both? Um, mm -hmm. Like repetition, but it's still within, like, within context. I mean, Absolutely. like, the cool thing about language that makes it a little more manageable, I suppose, is different situations. Restaurants are a really good example because, you know, there are only so many ways you can ask for stuff in a restaurant and it's always going to be using those same structures. So you're still like in a context, you're still doing something real. And anyone who's traveled and lived somewhere when they started learning the new language, shopping and restaurants and stuff like that, you get pretty good pretty quick. But mm. that's because it's, it's survival, survival language and it's, it, it has both. It has context and it has plenty of repetition. Mm. So, yeah, I agree. I'm not saying repetition's bad. It's, it's not at all. It's <laughs> like, you, like you said, learning an instrument, you, you just need to do the same things again and again. But instead of like repeating structures mm. or getting your students to repeat structures, don't get them to repeat structures, get them to repeat situations. I guess what it is is, you know, if a teacher has a really cool communicative lesson, the students still might need to, you know, check the board or check the book if they haven't really done enough. Today with, with new media, it's like people can, you know, watch, watch the same video many times, uh, watch the same, listen to the same songs many times. And, and, you know, that can happen outside the classroom where, so that in the classroom, communicative language teaching can really work. The flipping the classroom to get that content, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the language structures, the grammar in there, and then you could talk about it, but if, it's, if they got it more from some, you know, meaningful context that, where they repeated it and they were motivated, uh, then, then I think you're, you got it made. How do we get students to, to do that, uh, you know? That's our role, isn't it? Yeah. yeah to create those conditions. It's yeah. not gonna happen by saying, go out and repeat this or go out and do this. I was I'm really interested uh, about the, the Facebook posts, the Kill the Giraffe Facebook posts. There was a comment in the chat, you know, uh, I think it was Chris Rush, uh, who was saying, yeah, but if, if there's so much engagement, people love them. You know, is there something to be said about that? And, and mm -hmm. I'll tell you what I feel, and then you tell me what you feel. Uh, I, I, think, I think they're actually really cool if they spark an interest in language learning or they, they keep people, you know, engaged mm -hmm. in English. So if it's a gerund infinitive one, you know, mm. you know how, how do you learn, Jerry? Yeah. You know, like it's a, it's a, it could be a real springboard. I'm wondering if in social media, mm -hmm. it, it, it's not necessarily a bad thing. If it, if it's also, if it could be kind of easy in a way, like it's not some mm. stressful test. It's just some little thing. Do you know what I mean? I guess. Yeah. I mean, it'd be interesting if anyone's done some research on this, because this is probably quite an interesting area, but um, yeah, I mean, the question is, does it, does it lead, does it lead people to, um, want to explore English more? Or are people just really happy with like clicking buttons and getting the right answer? <laughs> like, is, it um, a, is it a gateway drug in a good sense? <laughs> if it's the case, then awesome. Like, yeah, that's yeah. great. We should encourage it as much as possible. But like, I'm not sure it is, but I don't know. I haven't checked any yeah. research on this. If you, can, if you can move people from a, a B, C yeah. to like discussion or whatever, then great. Yeah, maybe then it's definitely worth it. Yeah. What about your teacher training background? Because I know you've also done some of that. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think everyone should do it. Um, like, it doesn't matter if you're new or old, like an experienced teacher or just a brand new teacher. I really recommend it. Um, I got into it before I did my master's, before I really, I mean, I, I just considered myself a decent teacher, not, not like a sort of thinking teacher <laughs> in a way before mm -hmm. I did my master's. But um, yeah, no, I was at a school in Istanbul, a small school, and they encouraged all the teachers to give workshops, um, 
like uh, a couple of hour, like two hour workshops every now and again, which was great because like all sorts of teachers with different levels of experience and different backgrounds. So I, I got into it through that and I found I really enjoyed it. And I found that um, you, you start really improving when you, when you, when you start deciding to do something like this because you really have to research and think about it and you, you become better. Um, so yeah, that's how I got into it. So after that, I did the masters and then just basically got into going to IA TEFL conferences around the world um, mm -hmm. and, and submitting papers and giving talks. Um, and that, that was great fun. I, I enjoyed that because you had the traveling and you also, you got to meet other teachers and the teaching community, by the way, if anyone here hasn't been to a, an IA TEFL conference, you have local ones and big ones in the UK, go. I was talking to one of my friends who used to be a teacher. She's now like um, a town planner and she was saying, you're so lucky that you have such a supportive industry because people in the teaching world are incredibly supportive of each other. And when she goes to her, her plant town planning conferences, everyone is trying to like um, get up the ladder and yeah. um, gossip and stuff. So like, I think we're really lucky. We've got an incredibly good industry. So do it. I, I, I don't want to make this about me, but like about everyone here, like if you haven't submitted a talk at an IATFL conference, yeah. just do it and it, it changes you and you also just meet some fantastic people. For Clark and Miller, how, how did you guys start that and, and where do you sort of okay. start going? You got a lot of different things you're doing right now. Okay, yeah. Well, but Clark and Miller, like when you've been teaching for a while, you know this for sure, like you, you just pick up lots of gems, you know, like little things that work really well in the classroom, things that make students uh, like go, aha, and just little things that you know work really well and um, stuff that's useful for students and for teachers. And also, if you're just full of ideas, you, you need to put that somewhere. You can't just have it on your like C drive on your computer. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I just wanted to put all the gems somewhere. And the nice thing about having your own website, you're free to do what you like. You can put up terrible drawings. You can make awful jokes about dead giraffes. No one's gonna stop you. And I really like that. The freedom of that is, is great. So. That is the sort of motivation behind, behind starting it. Yeah. Um, in, in the future, we recently realized that um, we've got quite a lot of teachers uh, visiting our site. We thought we were mostly students, but we've got a lot of teachers coming and we've got a lot of teachers on our mailing list. So we, next thing we're gonna do, or next two things later, um, we wanna start producing lesson plans uh, for teachers correlating to each blog post. So. Uh, you got a blog post on, I don't know, um, gerunds and infinitives. Let's talk about them again. Um, and, you know, a lesson plan and possibly some classroom activities yeah. um, available to download as PDFs. I think that's our next, our next project. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. The podcast seems to be going well. Yeah, I mean, the thing about the podcast is, like, I keep talking about the MA course, and I'm going to keep talking about it. MA in Applied Linguistics and TESOL is incredible. It's such a great course. You learn so, so much cool stuff. And there was a lot of stuff I learned in the sort of more linguistics sort of area that um, I wanted to kind of just shout to the world about. It's like, hey, check this out, check this out. There's some weird stuff. <laughs> if you start exploring the world of linguistics, there's some strange stuff in there. Really cool, like innovative, odd, fascinating things. And I just wanted to share that stuff. So it started with just that idea. Stuff for teachers and learners to get like under the skin of the language. But I thought I'd also put out some posts for like just for learners as well. And, oh, there's such, yeah, an, just, over, just there's such an overlap. I mean, we all know that. Yeah. It's, no. Yeah. And that's the thing. I think just on that note, really quickly, um, like the, there's stuff out there for students and there's stuff out there for teachers, but also there's like a world where like they both can exist at the same time. Like, things that teachers need and like talking about are also the same things that learners need and like talking about a lot of the time. So I don't think there's a contradiction in having stuff for students and teachers at the same time. I think that, that can be really beneficial for everyone. There will be an Ask the Experts a session with Gabriel Clark uh, and with subsequent featured teachers with 22 people only. It will be cameras, microphones, it will be q and it'll be a sort of the town hall session um, on, on this topic, but it doesn't have to stay exactly on the topic, especially if you've you know, discovered things about Gabriel that you like, and if you go to his website, you see what he's doing with the image, with the drawings, the illustrations, it could be, you know, things related to Ask his Ask me work. anything. 
Yeah, yeah, because he's an expert. But, you know, the idea is we're all experts in different ways. Yeah, no, I love teachers. Teachers are awesome. I love talking to them. It's going to be my favorite part. <laughs>